Hello everybody, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 255. This week the questions are taken from guides 310 and 311. That's the Borodino or Ismail class battle cruisers of the Imperial Russian Navy that were never completed, and the R class submarines of the Royal Navy. And the Wednesday videos are the one on Greek fire, and the first video that we did on Admiral Jackie Fisher. And then there's an additional question from the video about learning about the treaty era book recommendations. So let's get on with it. Bounty Flamore asks, why did the Ottoman Navy stop winning battles after Lepanto? This has perplexed some people because the year after the Battle of Lepanto, the Ottomans showed up with a fleet that was pretty much near as much as makes the difference as large as the one they'd lost. The problem, however, comes down to not the ships that were lost, because ultimately, as they prove, ships can be easily replaced, uh, but the sailors. Because skilled sailors were, and indeed still are, and would be throughout the entirety of the Age of Sail, a very rare commodity. And of course, the Ottoman Empire put forth its fleet pretty much as the, a sum total effort by the Ottoman Empire itself. Obviously not 100%, they had ships and sailors elsewhere, but it was a good chunk of their available seamanship and vessels. Whereas the Holy League fleet was a, a mixture of lots of different organisations, everything from the entire Spanish Empire down to the Knights Hospitaller. But from those organisations, Whilst their commitment varied depending on the organisation, none of them committed as a percentage anything close to what the Ottomans committed and then subsequently lost. Um, one or two of the small organisations like the Hospitallers did commit a very large percentage of what they had, but they didn't lose it, um, which is kind of the point. And that meant that although there were up, up to about 10,000 dead on the Holy League side, that was split between all these different organisations and it wasn't a massive proportion of each organisation's available seamen, which then meant that as they reconstituted their fleets, they had a core and a fairly large body of experienced sailors to draw on. With the Ottomans, they took much, much higher casualties estimates up to around 30,000, so about three times as many killed as the Holy League fleet did. And on top of that, a good portion more were captured, uh, whether that be slaves within the ships or the crews on ships that surrendered. So the actual impact on the total cadre of Ottoman experienced sailors was massively, massively more. And some of their most experienced commanders and and sailors and officers were, as I said, either killed or captured, which then put them on something of a back foot because it meant that if they tried to go out again, their ships weren't as well manned, they weren't as well led, which then meant that subsequent encounters with various Western fleets would result in disproportionately higher losses still, which further eroded their capability. So you end up with a Ottoman force that can actually deploy a very large number of ships, but they are getting more and more unable to actually utilize them in a way that can bring them victory unless they happen to have absolutely overwhelming numbers in a specific situation compared to their enemies. Now, obviously, over time you can recover this, but it is, especially at this period, pretty much a generational hit that they will take. And by the time a generation or two has passed, and in theory they've got their sailors back up to the correct level of training and expertise, well, obviously everyone else has had a bit of a head start on them, and there's a bunch of technological progression as well, which tends to start giving the Western powers the upper hand, both uh, on a technical side and just on a pure economic side as well. And you can kind of see a similar thing happening in revolutionary Dash Napoleonic France because the French capability of producing warships was never in question. One of the things the Royal Navy found really annoying about the Marine Nationale at the time was the fact that you could have something like Trafalgar where you could decimate the enemy fleet and three, four years down the line, they would pretty much replenished their ship of the line numbers just by building new ones. But the advantage that the Royal Navy had and would continue to maintain was, amongst other things, the fact that the French rather handily executed most of their decent officers right at the start of the revolution and drove a bunch more into exile. And that in turn meant that the 
few remaining experienced officers or promoted um, enlisted who had good command skills were now on the back foot, which would mean that they would lose battles that perhaps if you'd had the original uh, Royal French Navy, they might have won. And of course, when they lose battles, they lose more ships captured, which takes people away out from France's cadre of sailors and officers tend to suffer higher casualties on the losing side as well. So it's a problem that actually repeats itself in a number of different naval warfare scenarios. Hammond Pickle asks, there are quite a few channels on YouTube that specialize in using AI to restore, colorize, and upscale up to 4K old film footage. Have you thought about getting in touch with one or two of them to do a collaboration to see what they could do with the intro footage for the five minute guides, dry dock, etc., or any other old archive footage that you might have? I think maybe interviewing one of them on the process that they use might be interesting as a Fun Friday instalment. However, I suspect that, well, I suspect that a number, and I know that a number of them like to keep their techniques close to heart because whilst they may be, in terms of what we as viewers of this channel are interested in, uh, you know, upscaling and uh, restoring old naval footage which is obviously, for the most part, therefore still going to be free to to look at, Um, those same techniques can be applied by them and are, I believe, applied by them commercially in some aspects to upscale stuff that can be then used in actual commercial projects. And as a result, uh, it's kind of like trade secrets. But, you know, if someone is out there who does regularly upscale um, old naval film footage and gets decent results out of it and is happy to discuss how they do it, then feel free to get in contact. I'd love to talk to you uh, because whilst I have degree, not not I'm not a professional by any means, but I'd say I'm a, perhaps a gifted amateur at using AI to upscale and restore static photos, um, I'm nowhere near competent enough to start touching the film footage that's available that's been digitized. So it would be of, of great interest to me. However, in terms of upgrading the intro footage for the five minute dry guides, dry docs, etc., I, I kind of think I'll leave them as is. It's a good reflection of what the film footage is actually like. And to be honest, it's there and gone in 15, 20, 20 30 seconds. Um, I don't think it's it's really worth it, to be honest. <laughs> In terms of old archive footage I might use, um, sure, that might, that might be interesting, albeit I would note that, generally speaking, when I do use archival footage, I tend to select for the stuff that's already naturally in relatively decent resolution. Now, granted, some one or two clips I've used could use a little bit of an upscale, um, but there is quite a lot of stuff that is metaphorically speaking been left on the cutting room floor during video productions I've done purely because the resolution I felt was too low to be worth putting on screen. UNSC Forward On To Dawn asks, suppose the Ismail was completed by the Soviets and received whatever refits or upgrades they thought they could give her prior to World War II. How useful would she have been in that conflict? Alternatively, if a Borodino class had been built in the Black Sea and commissioned in time to take part in World War I, how well would it have done against the Goban Dash Yavut Sultan Selim? Unfortunately, in both cases, the Borodino class ship would be in a little bit of a bind because in a World War II scenario, whether however much she's upgraded, she's pretty much going to suffer the same fate as the Ganguts did. The Kriegsmarine isn't really going to come after them straight up. The Luftwaffe is going to go after them first, at which point they're either going to be taking cover in harbour or they're going to be hit by the Luftwaffe while they're out at sea, or they're going to be hit by the Luftwaffe whilst they're in harbour, which, you know, is essentially what happened to all the Ganguts in one way, shape or form. Um, at which point a modernized Borodino is pretty much just going to have exactly the same fate. The slight increase in speed that she'd have isn't really going to help her all that much. So, yeah, apart from being another useful floating uh, gun battery for a siege, uh, then, yeah, there's there's not a huge amount of impact that she's going to make in World War II. 
conversely, if you go to World War One, in theory, there's an opportunity to make a much bigger impact. Um, but really only if the building times are actually somewhat close to reasonable. Because if you look at the historic rate at which they were being completed, that assuming that, you know, tensions and political revolution, etc. didn't overwhelm them, you'd be looking at the those ships being completed, well, a ship being completed the earliest in maybe nine, late mid to late 1917, at which point during 1917, Yavuz is non-operational due to lack of fuel. And then when she comes out to, and then she takes part in the Battle of Imbros in January, on her return, she hits a bunch of mines and is then pretty much out of action for most of 1918 as well. So a completed commission Borodino in 1917 just isn't going to get the opportunity to confront Yavutz simply because Yavutz is just outside of a few weeks, not really actually in an operational state. However, given the fact that they were started in 1912, if they followed somewhat more normal progression rates that you would see in most other navies, you would expect the first of the class to perhaps be launched in 1914, and maybe if they were rushed to completion for wartime, completed towards the end of 1915, beginning of 1916, at which point you could have uh, Borodino actually take on Yavutz in open combat, probably at the time when Yavutz went out and was actually chased off by one of the Russian dreadnoughts, at which point the Borodino would be fast enough to catch her or to prevent her from escaping and has a superior gun battery, at which point I would expect the Borodino to win the engagement relatively handily. You know, memes about the Russian Navy aside and much as deserved as they were for 1905 and to a certain extent in the Second World War, as the Imperial Russian Navy proved in World War One, they actually had a fairly competent naval force that had learned a lot of lessons from the Russo-Japanese War to the extent that you have pre-dreadnoughts that are able to briefly hold off dreadnoughts, you have pre-dreadnought squadrons acting together to see off battle cruisers and so on and so forth. So uh, a Borodino Yavuz fight in 1916, I I'm going to go put my money on the Russian ship. The Mighty Nanto asks, HMS Barham sank in just four minutes because she was struck by three torpedoes all near each other amidships, although given the short distance at which they were fired, I'm reasonably sure four of them hit. Would a modern battleship, such as an Iowa, King George V, Littorio, Bismarck, or even Yamato, survive such an attack? And how much time would the others stay afloat before going down after such an attack? Um, maybe, but I... Maybe for Yamato, but I I do doubt it. Now, you've got to remember, before anyone points out that, yes, Yamato was hit by lots and lots of torpedoes, aerial torpedoes, submarine launch torpedoes are substantially larger, um, and additionally, you know, multiple hits in multiple different locations, each of which attack a specific portion of the ship's torpedo defense system, can mean that you can hit a ship with quite a lot of firepower before it suffers severe damage. The main thing with Barham is that, at least by all official accounts, the three torpedoes um, all hit pretty much almost exactly the same place and in one after the other. Um, it's even described that they sent up pretty much one continuous water spout. Now, the reason that that makes a big, big difference is that it means that essentially the first torpedo hits the torpedo defense system and compromises it and okay the torpedo defenses amidships of pretty much any of the sighted vessels Iowa, KGB, Latoria, Bismarck or Yamato I would reckon would probably resist that hit there would be a little bit of flooding obviously but they would keep the internal spaces intact however if you then have a socking rate hole in the side of the ship with multiple compromised bulkheads, or in the case of Latorio, one compromised crush tube, big crush tube, and then another torpedo comes in and detonates, you've got whatever you have left of your torpedo defense system to resist that hit, which is almost certainly going to then breach the torpedo defense system and cause a fairly major degree of flooding internally. And of course, amidships is where the machinery spaces are. And then, 
you've got a third torpedo hit, which again, judging by the accounts, and the, the second torpedo hit will have widened the, the breach in, um, outside in the first place. This third one is if, even against something like Yamato or KGV's torpedo defense system is pretty much going to be having a free ride straight up to or possibly even into your hull, at which point it's going to cause catastrophic levels of flooding internally, um, which at that point, I think, well, the Barham is obviously smaller than any of these vessels, so there is more reserve buoyancy available. And... I think probably with Barham, the torpedo defences were compromised by the first hit and then the next two really went deep in. So whilst I wouldn't think that the more modern ships would go down as quickly as Barham did, I do think that the overall um, buoyancy of any of those ships would probably be fatally compromised by similar level of torpedo hits um yamato may just have the sheer mass to ball through it maybe but would be heavily crippled and would have a massive problem with stability or you know, loads of water on one side so it may capsize anyway so yeah in, in my estimation i don't think any of them would actually survive such a hit series of hits but they might hang around for considerably longer it's mostly going to depend, I think, on two things. One is how subdivided are your machinery spaces, and two, just how much mass, how much displacement is your vessel. Obviously, as I said, the higher the displacement, then these torpedoes causing a certain amount of flooding is if the big if the ship is larger, that is proportionally less. So even if it does drag the ship over on its side and then cap it capsizes and sinks, it's going to take longer. Brendan Buersdorf asks, could you discuss the German guided bombs, namely the Fritz X and the HS-239? I'm curious as to how effective overall they were and if they were worth the expense. Well, both weapons suffered in the late mid to late sections of the war by the fact that they required guidance from their parent aircraft and those aircraft tended to have to fly in straight lines and especially in the case of Fritz X relatively slowly which made them very easy pickings um, plus of course you were trying to fly, fly in a straight line with the German bomber in late war Europe which over allied forces is not necessarily something with the world's longest life expectancy anyway um, but in the time period where they were being used to some reasonable effect my personal evaluation is that actually the HS-239 was the better weapon. Um, it seems to have scored considerably more hits it, and therefore had sank considerably more vessels. Of course, HS-239 was designed to attack smaller, less well-armoured or unarmoured vessels. So, of course, it's going to have potentially proportionally better effects anyway because an HS-239 that hits a frigate or a corvette or a destroyer or a transport or something like that stands a reasonable chance of either fatally damaging or at least writing off that vessel whereas a single fritz x hit to a battleship or something like that may not actually kill it unless it's lucky enough to hit a magazine as happened with roma and the hs239 launch uh, the way you launch it and guide it is actually slightly more survivable than launching a fritz x now the Fritz X, whilst it was very, very effective, I, well, if it hit something, I actually think the Fritz X suffers from being a bit too effective, uh, specifically because when you look at a lot of ships that were hit by Fritz X bombs, everything from Savannah, as you can see here, um, all the way up to Warspite and everything in between, one of the things that you consistently note about a lot of Fritz X attacks is that they hit, they smash clean through the deck armor, and then they smash clean through the rest of the decks, then they smash clean through the bottom of the ship, and motor on down into the, well, into the water. Not motor on, because they're unguided, but you get the idea. They fly off into the sea, and then detonate. And you might think, in theory, maybe that would cause a sort of under-the-keel mining effect, but it seems that that doesn't happen Um in most cases, uh, the bomb actually just goes too far down for that to actually have a 
a particularly major impact. Um, at which point, whilst the ship has taken catastrophic damage, and you know there's a hole straight through it right to the bottom and out, that's nowhere near as bad uh, a level of damage as it would be if the Fritz X had detonated in the lower portions of the ship. The, you know, there's a lot of ships, Savannah and Warspite included, that very well might have been sunk if the bomb had done that instead of punching straight through. So it, it was a case of very much over penetration. Um, so combined with the fact that of the two, the Fritz X is is at the more risky for the mothership to launch and then guide. I think the HS239 is actually the more effective weapon by a fairly long shot. If they'd modified the Fritz X, maybe it could have been more effective, caused more big sinkings, but they didn't. Um, you basically had to rely on the luck of the Fritz X hitting enough major important features with lots of steel to slow it down enough for it to detonate inside the ship, which is pretty much what happened with Roma. Um, were they worth the expense overall? Well, I mean, that gets into the sort of rather larger meta question of was anything Germany did in the mid to late war to save off defeat worth the expense? Um, but given the overall casualties to relatively highly, tra highly trained bomber crews and some of their latest bombers versus the results they achieved from them, I'd say Fritz X at the end of the day probably wasn't worth it. Its two biggest successes are against Roma and Warspite. Roma was not going to be involved in the war again anyway, and Warspite came back and kept fighting. Okay, minus one turret, but still came back and kept fighting. So, you know, how effective was that? Overall, probably not worth the overall investment and the number of losses taken to accomplish that. Whereas HS239 did make a meaningful impact. It forced the Allies to convert devote considerable resources to stopping it. And if you were to say, okay, if we take all HS239 operating squadrons and give them Fritz X's, I don't think it manifestly makes a huge difference to things. Whereas if you said, okay, we're going to take all the Fritz X operating aircraft and give them HS239s, whilst I don't think it's going to, you know, stop the Allied invasions, it certainly could cause a heck of a lot more problems before countermeasures come up than even the historic offensive did. Badger2305 asks, how might World War II have been different if the R-class submarines had been retained and developed in the interwar era? In particular, would the Battle of the Atlantic have been changed by this, particularly in the Western approaches? So if the R-class themselves were in service in World War II. I don't think they would have made a huge difference. They would have been very run down at that stage, even with some degree of refit and modernization. Um, and obviously their speed, whilst very impressive, actually underwater even by World War II standards, you know, is extremely impressive compared to World War I subs, but there has been a degree of technological progression. Um, nonetheless, if some kind of modernized R class had been retained. Um, I think the Royal Navy probably, given that they're relatively short range, um, if they've been updated, say with ASDIC or something, would have probably put them to work patrolling sections of either the English Channel or maybe even on semi-offensive patrols close to German minefields off of their own coast and then later the French coast in an effort to actively hunt down U-boats in the relatively narrow areas where they knew the U-boats were going to leave. Um, that might actually work very well with air cover, because if the German, if the sorry, if the Allies know that the Germans are going to be transiting out of their ports underwater, because they're being kept underwater by aircraft, that puts them in the ideal hunting environment for an R-class. But as I said, you know, their capabilities would be somewhat limited by their age at that stage. However, the second part of your question about if they'd been developed, now that is really interesting because if the R-Class had been taken and further developed into kind of a son of R-Class, which presumably would have been somewhat bigger with 1930s era batteries, 1930s era diesels, um, and purpose inbuilt as Dick system, as well as more advanced hydrophones right from the start, and a battery of uh, torpedoes, then things start to get very, very worrying for German subs, because you then have some 
essentially small high speed fast attack subs and pretty much everything I just said about the R class, if they've been modernized, applies to them as well. You essentially have a branch of the Royal Navy that is now actively hunting U-boats, which, yeah, that, that could be interesting. Again, they're still going to be probably relatively short range craft. So I would expect them to be operating off of U-boat staging grounds, you know, off of Brest and places like that later in the war, maybe off of uh, in the North Sea in the early part of the war. Um, and certainly still, again, at the, on the English Channel. I wouldn't necessarily want to put them out in Western approaches or in the Atlantic, because, of course, at that point, you would have Allied submarines operating alongside U-boats, and there'd be a rather dramatic possibility for friendly fire, um, you know, with Allied anti-sub escorts potentially sinking the descendants of the R-Class, which wouldn't be particularly brilliant. But potentially, especially once the Allies have taken over Iceland, you could maybe, if if the son of our class has a bit of a longer range, you could maybe have them operating out of Iceland, at least in flotilla strength, and you could have them guided by Ultra. So they would obviously have to stay away from the convoys and the convoys' active escorts, but if Ultra goes, ah, oh, yes, well, we have detected a wolf pack and they're strung out along this line, um, then you could send our class or the son of our class out and they then closing in on what would be known German U-boat positions could listen out for and take out German U-boats well ahead of the convoys arriving. And then they would know roughly when the convoys were due to arrive in the area and they could then make themselves scarce during that period. That would probably confuse the Germans massively because, you know, the Germans could use all the intel, the assets they have in up to and including uh, Condors, and they would see that there's no Allied aircraft involved, there's no Allied surface vessels involved. These U-boats that are on their Wolf Pack patrol lines just seem to up and vanish. What's going on? Who knows? Um so yeah, it could potentially be a really, really big thorn in the U-boat side, uh, especially if the, you know if the Allies, or especially the UK in this case, is focusing on developing these hunter killers further and incorporating Aztec into them. Then you may also see perhaps the Allies developing acoustic homing torpedoes a little bit earlier because the acoustic homing torpedo has less utility for the Allies as it does compared to the Germans for most of World War II, although obviously it is still a useful weapon. But if you have an underwater sub that is firing its torpedoes in a 3D environment based entirely off of hydrophone or Aztec returns, then suddenly the utility of a guided or homing torpedo makes an awful lot more sense and Therefore, the impetus to develop one might go up significantly. Of course, you then have to factor in the fact, does, does Germany know what the R-Class are supposed to be or the son of R-Class? And are they aware of what the Royal Navy is doing with them? And what would they do to try and develop a counter if they knew? And could they develop a counter? Who knows? Josh Thomas Moore asks, were there any attempts to mount a flamethrower-like device on an age of sail ship? Or was it just seen as easier and simpler to use fire ships? Very much the latter. Um, partly because obviously the secrets to Greek fire had been lost. There were known incendiary devices, fire pots, uh, flaming darts, fire arrows, uh, fire javelins, this kind of thing. Um, but <laughs> ships captains obviously being very, very loath to allow large amounts of flammables on their ships generally, and then being told, well, yeah, we want to take this pressurized container of um, flammable liquid aboard uh, in a period when most actions were done at boarding range, it, particularly with obviously the larger vessels that you have in the age of sail. It's just, it's not worth it, especially with the sheer amount of gunfire even with um you know going as far back as the armada or periods before that there's still so much more heavy ordnance flying through the air that if you have a pressurized container of um, flammable liquids on your ship it may very well get punctured by shot and then you have a large 
pressurized container of flammable liquids going off on your own ship, which isn't great. Um, so yeah, there's lots of reasons not to use flamethrower-like devices on in the Age of Sail. Whereas a fire ship, okay, you were expanding an entire ship, but at least the problem was happening over there, not near you. Now, that's not to say that people didn't try to reinvent some form of a flamethrower-like device, but again, in the absence of significant amounts of a reliably vicious but controllable liquid incendiary, they had to look to other methods. Uh, the Spanish Armada, for example, had uh, some bombarda, as they called them, aboard. Now, a bombarda, at least in that context, is not a bombard as in a short howitzer-like cannon, uh, which you might immediately think of, it, of. It's actually a long wooden tube that looks kind of like a cannon, but, uh, cannon, but what they've done inside it is they've done stages of loose pack gunpowder, followed by a bunch of shrapnel-like shot, followed by some densely packed gunpowder, followed by loosely packed gunpowder, and it repeats. The idea being you take this tube that's full of various grades of packed gunpowder and set fire to it when you get close to an enemy ship. The loose pack gunpowder, in theory, will then flare out, kind of like a short-range flamethrower, and as that burns out, it will reach the next stage, which will then set off the dense pack gunpowder, which will blast a bunch of shrapnel across the deck, so anyone who hasn't been set on fire will now get shot by bits and pieces of iron and stone, which then repeats itself all the way down the barrel until hopefully you are now ready to board and everybody that you are trying to, or potentially going to fight on the enemy deck is either on fire or has been shot full of holes or has been shot full of holes and is on fire um, or has jumped over the side to escape that. It all sounds perfectly fine in theory, except uh, those of you who have worked with gunpowder can probably see exactly where this is going. And yes, an awful lot of them tended to just explode immediately when you set fire to them. There's a rather comical, fortunately comical picture um, from some uh, group that tried to actually recreate one of these things for scientific testing. Of course, in the modern day, if you have a nine foot tube packed full of gunpowder, the modern health and safety standards they stay say that you have to be very far away from it when you set light to it, um, just in case, which turned out to be just as well because they set light to it and it went boom, um, which obviously back in the Armada is not really a brilliant idea setting off a nine foot gunpowder bomb on your own deck. And fortunately in the modern era, everyone was far enough away they weren't injured, so you just get a funny photo. Christopher Babylon asks, knowing the technology and basic chemistry and elements that were known back in their time, what in your personal opinion was Greek fire made of? Now, as I covered in the video in question, there are, at least in my opinion, three core ingredients that appear often enough in various descriptions that I think it's relatively safe to say that's probably, you know, the, some of the core elements of it, that being sulfur um, and pine resin, and then what the, they term naphtha. We today have a very specific term. Uh, naphtha is a very specific distillate of oil. Um, back then, naphtha was used a little bit more broadly uh, to mean essentially what we would today call some kind of petroleum or light crude oil-based product. Um, if it was really thick, they did know about the differences and they called them things like tar and bitumen and so forth. But the lighter fractions of crude oil, they seem to just generally be naphtha. Um, now, exactly what degree of refinement that is, is a little bit up for grabs because there were um, sources of lighter crude bubbling to the surface um, in the areas that the Byzantines initially controlled. And whether they just took those straight or whether they subject them to any kind of refining process and how how far along the grade you got from essentially a, a light crude towards a fully refined petroleum product, that's a bit up in the air. But to be perfectly honest, it doesn't make a huge degree of difference to the overall flammability um, or projection capabilities, especially once you've mixed in the pine resin and the sulfur. So, you know, those would be, I think, the, the ingredients that any mix would have to take into account. But then you have, well, while that would actually make a very, as was kind of ruined, a very good incendiary mix, the remaining bit is the auto-ignition on water element, um, 
with, and the fact that it's also very difficult to put out because that particular mix, whilst it is a very nasty mix, um, there are some things that could put it out that are actually listed in various sources as not being able to put out Greek Fire. And to my mind, there are potentially four candidates for the fourth ingredient or possibly a mixture of these four um, compounds which could be multiple candidates for a fourth fifth or sixth element um, and would also explain why it was much more difficult to get hold of because getting hold of some form of petroleum product sulfur and pine resin that's not very difficult which you know comes up with a problem of how why couldn't anyone else replicate it whereas this mystery fourth or fourth and fifth ingredients would be the things that made it almost impossible to replicate now in my initial test which i did in in the video i used calcium oxide aka unslaked quicklime uh, because that in contact with water produces a huge amount of heat it's an ex very exothermic reaction which could cause self-ignition um, there were some issues depending on how I mixed it with sometimes it just binding up with the sulfur and the resin in a big lump but that's a matter of what what uh, which ones you add first second and third and also how it's all stirred and what temperature it reaches and all sorts of things so that's not really so much of a concern the thing is unslaked quick lime again is relatively accessible in the time period but so it kind of is both a for and against because it being relatively accessible means there's no reason why they couldn't have it in there but it being um easily accessible would also mean it should in theory be fairly easily replicable and of course it generates a lot of heat it doesn't actually generate fire most of the time so the heat might then be enough to set off the rest of the ingredients but it is a little bit of an edge case. The other ingredients which potentially could have been there might have been um, simple olive oil. Again, very common, so would have been easily replicable. But as we all know, what happens when you put an oil, a hot oil on water, you get oil fires. Yeah, that potentially is a thing and would, it would be very energetic. You try and put water and or any kind of moisture laden thing on a on a, a mixture that's containing hot or burning olive oil and you are going to have an absolute pig of a time trying to put it out but you know so that's a possibility the other two are calcium carbide which would produce acetylene gas which would probably auto ignite but quite how you produce calcium carbide back then is a little bit of a difficult question to answer um in theory it could be done um but you'd be reaching a little bit. The other one is calcium phosphide, which could be done with the, the materials and techniques they had on hand. There's no particular direct evidence that they did, but it could have happened. Um, and calcium phosphide on contact with water releases phosphine gas, which is both incredibly toxic and auto ignites in contact with air, which definitely would cause an auto igniting solution on water. Um, so, you know, one, two, or maybe even three of those ingredients added to the Greek fire mix, the basic Greek fire mix, might be the thing that you're looking at. However, of course, um, that requires further experimentation, which hopefully I am planning to try and get done next year, uh, with the only problem being that um, calcium carbide and olive oil obviously easy to get hold of. Calcium phosphide, for very obvious reasons, is much harder to get hold of. Plus the fact that in the UK, whilst I can, in the safe environment, experiment with the mixture itself, I cannot experiment easily with projecting it out of some sort of flamethrower because a flamethrower <laughs> is a prohibited weapon in the UK and uh, building your own is somewhat frowned upon. Um, there are You can get licenses to possess Section 5 uh, web firearms which include flamethrowers but I'd have to work with very specific individuals in very specific environments to do so um, so potentially I could conduct the experiments in a rocket lab which might have the necessary licensing um, because technically speaking liquid fuel rockets are a form of flamethrower um, or I may have to arrange to conduct the experimentation in conjunction with somebody maybe another uh, channel that specializes in pyrotechnics or someone else who has the requisite equipment over in the US, where unless you're in California or Maryland, I believe flamethrowers are somewhat less restricted. Dave Collier wants to know, what's the difference between Trafalgar Knight and Pickle Knight in the Royal Navy? 
They technically are centered around the same event, the Battle of Trafalgar, but Trafalgar Night is traditionally celebrated by the commissioned officers of the Royal Navy on the 21st of October, i.e. the anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar, or if you're sure, whatever date is closest to that that's convenient that everyone can organize. And it's a relatively grand dinner with a few interesting, funny little traditions thrown in, whereas Pickle Night is actually, unfortunately for everyone who likes pickles, but fortunately for me, nothing to do with actual pickles. It's named after HMS Pickle, the Bay, well, essentially dispatch boat, a very, very small vessel that was sent ahead of the main fleet to bring news of the Battle of Trafalgar to uh, the UK, which means it is celebrated either on or around about the time that Pickle landed in the UK, which is the 5th of November, which coincidentally happens to be the same night as Bonfire Night in the UK, uh, when everybody celebrates Guy Fawkes failing to blow up the Houses of Parliament. And so sometimes Pickle Night is held very on a slightly different day, again ashore, but on board ships it's more likely to be held on the exact day in question. And by process of elimination, it is celebrated by the um, the non-commissioned officers, the warrant officers, and all the enlisted sailors. And it's uh, not so much a grand dinner, it's more a kind of uh, here is all the food and in all one big bowl and everybody, you know, essentially drink a lot, eat a lot and sing a lot of sea shanties commemorating the victory, which is pretty much what you'd expect from a below deck celebration. Trevor Polasek asks, in your Battle of Samar video, you mentioned that Samuel B. Roberts was down to firing star shells. How did it go through so much ammunition so quickly? Was it the rate of fire, low magazines, or something else? Essentially, rate of fire and the length of the engagement. So the Roberts had Mark 30 mounts of varying mods, depending on which you're, whether you're looking at the fore or aft mount, but she ostensibly carried 325 rounds per gun. But given that the rate of fire of that particular type of mounting is somewhere between 15 to 20 rounds a minute and obviously they were very motivated to be firing those rounds that actually gives you about 15 to 20 minutes total firing time assume before you've emptied the magazines assuming that you're firing at absolute maximum rate the entire time now obviously she wasn't doing that because she was in the engagement for over an hour and okay as you mentioned towards the end she was running out of shells but given that she was in an engagement for well over an hour and that if she had been firing continuously, she would have exhausted her magazines in a third to a quarter of that time. It's, and that's, you know, that's down to the very last shell. That's your anti-aircraft rounds, your general high capacity rounds, your star shells, um, training rounds. If that's everything, that's the very last projectile aboard the ship. So it's not, exactly surprising that, that at that point she would have been you know down to flinging star shells at people because she she would have burned through her what you might call quote unquote normal ammunition allowance in sort of 10 to 15 minutes of continuous firing at which point she's down to the specialist stuff and you know she's in there for a lot longer than 10 to 15 minutes essentially and of course, this is assuming that she starts off with full magazines and that she hasn't expended a single round since she was stocked up and left harbour. The Judge 2017 asks, how were landing craft transported between operations? I can't see landing craft being driven back to bases waiting for the next operation. Well, it depends what kind of landing craft you mean. If you mean landing craft in the classic Omaha beach assault sense, if you, you know, so watch Saving Private Ryan or something like that, then you're probably thinking about LCAs or the landing craft assault, which you can see in this picture. Now, the LCAs, granted, yes, they are fairly short range, fairly slow craft. They are not really in a shape to be trundling around between operational theatres. But as you can see in the again in the picture, but behind the LCA that's in the front, these would be transported basically like large ships, boats on davits on various other larger craft you know, troop ships bigger landing craft etc etc 
and these would stand offshore. The men would get into the LCAs. The LCAs would be loaded in the water. They'd go ashore, and then when the tide was high enough to refloat them, or they'd been towed off, then they'd come back to their mothership and be hoisted back aboard for taking off to another theatre. However, there are also larger landing craft that could be present at the beaches, so LCIs, landing craft infantry, LCIL, landing craft infantry large, LCT, landing craft tank, and whilst some of these craft aren't particularly large in the grand scheme of warships, they are still, at least when if you stick a massive fuel tank in where they would normally be transporting troops, more than capable of taking themselves across various seas and maybe even oceans, albeit some of them would also get a bit of assistance from a tow. And some of them are actually, you know, small to medium sized ships in their own right. A few models actually outmassing some torpedo boats uh, or small destroyers that were in use as general uh, high seas going craft and obviously therefore more than capable of wandering around all on their own. And that's before you get into obviously the, the rear echelon stuff like the big ships that the LCAs were hosted from. So when it came to how a landing craft is transported between operations, it really depends on the make and model because some of them will need to be carried, some of them will need a bit of a tow, and some of them can just make their own way there. Yakuzka Girls Marine High School training vessel Harakaze asks, During the Vietnam War, there was an airstrike that dropped a toilet from the USS Midway. This made me wonder, apart from the O'Bannon in World War II, what other strange weapons were used in the time that this channel covers? USS O'Bannon, of course, uh, famously having supposedly pelted a Japanese conning tower of a submarine with potatoes. There are quite a number. I mean, when you look at the close range encounters between a number of Allied warships and German U-boats or Japanese submarines, uh, quite often when one or the other is trying to ram or they're otherwise really, really close and the main guns can't depress low enough to engage the sub, and of course the sub's deck gun might be able to engage the ship, you see all sorts of weird and wonderful improvised weapons, everything from tins of food, um, Coke bottles in the case of one Canadian Corvette, and of course, you know, whatever else happens to come to hand. Now, these things aren't obviously designed to sink the opponent. They are designed to keep the heads down of the enemy crew, because obviously if you are a U-boat crewman, you need to get out of the conning tower, down the conning tower to the deck gun and make it ready to load, aim and fire. That is made somewhat more difficult when you have fairly hard, solid objects being thrown at great velocity at you from high above, relatively speaking, because then those things, if they do hit you, could potentially do a lot of damage. And so people tend to, you know, duck out of the way. Plus, of course, Depending on their contents or their makeup, they may pose additional secondary hazards. You know, thrown glass bottles will also create fields of broken glass on, which will be more difficult to walk on. Um, thrown containers of something that is vaguely liquid will make things slippery. Now, obviously, no one's making a particularly strategic decision of, ah, I shall throw a Coke bottle at this enemy submarine commander's head because it will have a, a shrapnel effect of burst glass. It's just, it's a solid object that's nearby in significant quantities that I can lob at my opponent. Um, occasionally smaller brass cartridges ended up being used in that role as well. And as time goes further back, you do see all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So, you know, stuffing the cutlery into a cannon to create shrapnel a la Pirates of the Caribbean, probably not going to happen on the basis that the vast majority of cutlery that everyone would have had around would have been either wooden or horn, neither of which makes particularly brilliant shrapnel against a thick wooden-sided vessel, or it would have been very carefully guarded sharp eating knives, which you're not going to sacrifice very quickly or easily, and the metal cutlery would be in the officer's mess, which will probably have been taken and stashed down below um, deep in the ship before the battle, which would make it very difficult to access. But randomly stuffing relatively solid lumps of things into a cannon at the last minute to create an impromptu grape shot did occur several times in the Age of Sail. Um, it could be fragments of enemy cannonballs if they cooled down far enough. Occasionally it could be broken fragments of your own ship, because whilst I did say, you know, firing a 
wooden fork out of a cannon probably isn't going to do a huge amount of damage because it's already quite small and will be turned into even smaller bits. A relatively chunky bit of oak might do a fairly nasty number on an opponent if it manages to catch the person and doesn't have to blast through the hull. Albeit, again, if you are down to the point in an Age of Sail engagement where you're having to abandon the idea of firing solid shot at anybody or grape shot or whatever, and you're just looking for random bits of things you can pick up from the deck, well, you're probably going to run out of those pretty quickly because... You know, firing one cannon with that is fine. Firing a dozen or more, you're going to use up an awful lot of loose material very quickly. And it then means you're out of ammo, which means that's a good time to decide that you're going to surrender. And then, of course, you have the slightly larger unusual weapons, which could be used at various points during uh, the period the channel covers. So Congreve rockets, for example, you might think, well, a Congreve rocket is a weapon of the period. It's a little unusual for a ship, but maybe having a, a bomb vessel, i.e. a bombardment vessel, with a Congreve rocket launcher or two instead of a mortar, that might not be too unusual. And I would agree with you that it's not terrifically unusual. And either replacing the mortar with or supplementing it with Congreve rocket launchers was done. But there were also ships that experimented with having rocket launchers that launched out of the gun ports. So... When the ship pulled up alongside to deliver broadside, instead of rolling out a bunch of guns and firing solid shot at you, that you could open the gun ports and a massive volley of gunpowder rockets might come flying at you, which would be more than a little worrying, I would imagine. Donovan Lawler asks, I recently saw a video by the History Guy about HMIS Bengal and the MV Ondina's encounter with a pair of Japanese commerce raiders. We hear a lot about German commerce raiding, but there's next to nothing on Japanese commerce raiding efforts. What can you tell us about that? Well, there isn't really a huge amount to tell. Compared to the Hilfskreuzer program in Germany, the or indeed the RAM series that the Italians put out, the Japanese commerce raiders were really a bit of a disappointment. Partly that become, comes from the fact that the Japanese didn't really plan for this anywhere near to the level that the Germans did with the Hilfskreuzers. The Japanese, as you probably picked up from Kantai Kessin, were looking for a decisive battle with Navy versus Navy. And if there was going to be any raiding to do, well, they could probably get some cruisers to do it once the big battle had been fought. And that was pretty much the attitude. So there were the occasional forays by Japanese line cruisers that went out and tried to do commerce raiding to varying degrees of success. But in terms of the armed merchant raiders, there's very few of them. The Japanese essentially started converting some of their larger, faster passenger liners pretty much around the start of the, their involvement in World War II into armed merchant ships. And... You know, armament, speed, size, etc. wise, they actually, on paper at least, compare relatively well to the Hilfskreuzer. They're, they're the two main ones which you would have heard about in that video about the Bengal and the Onida would be the Aikoku Maru and the Hokoku Maru. And being X-liners, obviously having that turn of speed, they're quite good at tracking down enemy vessels and sinking them or capturing them, depending on the needs of the Japanese at the time. But... As I say, they were a little bit of a rush job. They proved in the Bengal Onida encounter why they don't really want to get into a gunfight, even with ships that are relatively unarmed compared to them, because, of course, there is no armor, there's not really much comp compartmentalization, and one lucky hit, and suddenly everything's on fire and exploding, especially when you're very heavily armed for what was ostensibly before a passenger-cargo ship. Then the rest of them, you might think, well, hang on, if you, you said there were others. Well, yes, there were. They Just over a dozen total Japanese vessels were converted to the armed merchant cruiser role. However, the lack of the Japanese Navy in all sorts of things, including transports and convoy escorts, meant that for the most part, almost every other Japanese commerce raider that was converted to the purpose ended up being entirely or almost entirely dragged back into more conventional naval operations, whether that be patrolling in Japanese-held waters to release somewhat more purpose-built warships for frontline service, 
escorting merchant ships, uh, convoys of the of the Japanese own convoys um, to prevent them from being attacked by theoretical Allied surface raiders, which led to a number of the Japanese armed merchant cruisers getting sunk by submarines, and as I said, also being used as transports in frontline operations. Uh, at which point a number of them were bombed by various U.S. Navy and U.S. Army Air Force uh, aircraft, which also tended to sink them fairly well. And given, of course, the fact that in terms of shipbuilding, the Japanese had a lot more emphasis on shipbuilding because of the nature of the Pacific War than the Germans did, meant that the Japanese shipbuilding industry, which was never able to keep up with the demands placed on it, was forced to look primarily at supplementing the more conventional frontline warship strength of the Japanese Navy and trying to replace a lot of stuff that had been lost. So there wasn't really the time, money or effort available to try and convert a much more extensive fleet of our merchant raiders, which in any case would have been relatively unlikely to have a huge amount of impact compared to the Hilfskreuzer because of the nature of the convoy routes to and from the US, to and from Australia, etc., etc., they were much more fixed, much easier to defend, and much more difficult for the Japanese to send ships to intercept because there was a naval front line with a lot of ships, a lot of submarines, and a lot of aircraft involved. So although the first two Japanese vessels to this role did prove you could slip out into the shipping lanes, it very rapidly became a rather unattractive and low priority job for the Japanese Navy because why send out a relatively large, relatively fast merchant vessel armed with guns that you could easily use on other warships on a mission that might minutely annoy Allied commercial shipping and if you're really lucky might bring home an extra ship or two over the course of months obviously with prize crews and so forth, as compared to just taking that ship and using it to make in the same time maybe up to a dozen shuttle runs full of cargo that you desperately need. History for Real asks, It has often been suggested the sinking of RMS Titanic was due to critical design flaws and short-sighted engineering, but the current surveys of the wreck show a series of holes were caused along a significant length of the ship compromising quite a few compartments. From what I can find, compartmentalization, particularly amongst civilian vessels of the time, was rather lacking and new. How, in your estimation, would a warship of the era fare against similar damage, assuming that the holes themselves could not be plugged? And in particular, what would you expect to be the difference between a capital ship or a lesser warship? Generally speaking, a warship of that period, assuming it's a relatively recent one, the same way as Titanic was a relatively recent liner, would have coped with the damage significantly better. Uh, for one thing, a lot of warships would have been able to manoeuvre clear of the iceberg, given the same amount of warning, simply because, they're, apart from anything else, before you get into the hydrodynamics of you know length versus length to beam ratios and hull forms and everything, they're just smaller, so they have less inertia, so they can turn a little bit quicker <laughs> before, because, without obviously hitting the iceberg. But assuming that they did, which is what you suggested... There are still a number of ways in which a warship would stand a much better chance. One thing, obviously, is a warship is much more heavily compartmentalised, which will limit the spread of the flooding somewhat. Um, secondly, secondly, some warships of the period have distributed armour that carries all the way up to the bow, so some of the initial uh, gashes in the bow of Titanic would be roughly at a level where they'd expect to encounter some of that distributed armour. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that two, three-inch thick armour plate, plus or minus a little bit, would necessarily be able to stop the iceberg from opening a hole completely, but it certainly would probably limit the damage a little bit compared to just standard hull plating. And although anti-torpedo defences aren't exactly massively advanced in ships built in the very late 1900s and early 1910s. They still do have things like anti-torpedo bulkheads, which would help to contain the flooding. And there's 
also the nature of the areas that are being flooded. I've pointed out before in questions about the Titanic that one of the major flaws Titanic had, not that it would necessarily have saved her, but it might have delayed the ship sinking somewhat, is that most ships at the time, especially warships, obviously everyone's carrying coal for the most part, but the coal bunkers are positioned on the sides of the ship, um, i.e. on either wing of the engine rooms. That provides, in addition to obviously anti-torpedo bulkheads and so forth, a degree of protection because if you open up the hull and the coal bunker starts to flood, well, coal for the most part, not all the time, but for the most part, is around about as dense or maybe a fraction denser than water. Occasionally you get bits of coal that will float, but usually they're just a little bit denser. But what that means is that if the coal bunker is relatively full of coal, the water can't displace the coal and that coal was already there. So the available volume within the coal bunker, assuming it's not empty for the water to fill is somewhat reduced, which means less water can actually get in before it has to breach out of the coal bunker. Plus, of course, then you at the time it, the water needs to build up enough pressure to breach the coal bunker hatches, which we know did happen in the transverse coal bunkers on Titanic eventually, which is why I say it wouldn't necessarily save Titanic, but it would have delayed things. Warships also, especially at that period, tend to have slightly more pumping capacity because they're expecting to take damage a lot more than liners are. And so they have both lots of pumps and also backups in case some of them fail. And that's just to name a few factors. So I would personally think a battleship or battle cruiser of the time that sideswiped that iceberg would probably survive. It would be crippled to be certain, but assuming the crew are on the ball, they will almost, the ship will almost certainly survive and it will definitely last long enough for significant repairs to be made or for ships to come and take the crew off if for some reason it is in fact fatally damaged. Now the only caveat to that would be as you mentioned if there's a difference between capital ships and lesser warships well yes proportional to the overall length and volume of the ship the damage that would be caused by the fixed number of gashes in the hull that Titanic took would be proportionally much much greater on a World War One era cruiser. I mean, an, okay, an armored cruiser might not be massively removed from a battleship in terms of overall size, but it being having a narrow length to beam ratio it will have less in the term of side protection underwater, and also mass somewhat less generally. A, a light cruiser, light protected cruiser, protected cruiser, whatever you want to call it, um, is five, six, maybe seven thousand tons if you're lucky but probably towards the lower end and possibly even smaller. And of course, a destroyer, you know, you're lucky to break over a thousand tons with a destroyer at this period, at which point those smaller ships will be incredibly more vulnerable because if you open up that amount of their hull, again, much less, if any, side protection, apart from maybe the, a coal bunker or two, and certainly with some of the destroyers, that might be a greater than 50% amount of their total hull length. So of course, a much smaller vessel would be much more vulnerable to e exactly the same amount of damage being done to them. But then, of course, a destroyer or a cruiser is much, much, much more likely to have just gotten out of the way in the first place. And that concludes this week's episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. And I hope to see you again in another video at some point soon. Bye.